Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. My name's Christy. I'm going to be moderating today. Um, today, we're joined by our Azure Certified Solutions Architect. Um, so we've got our in-house Azure expert with us today, Spencer Duke. Thanks for joining us today, Spencer. Um, today, Spencer's not only going to show you what Azure Migrate, uh, what the Azure Migrate tool can do for you, um, and what it can produce as far as KPIs, costs, dependencies of your potential migration. Um, but we're going to start with why Azure to begin with. Um, what is the reason for moving to the cloud? What are the things that you should be considering before your move? Um, as always, I'll be monitoring the chat for questions. So please go ahead and use that Q&A button on your screen if you have any questions throughout. And I'll make sure I get those to Spencer if we can't get to them today for some reason. Um, we will certainly make sure to follow up with you um, and have a conversation on whatever it is you're looking for. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Spencer and we'll dive into why we're here. Great. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, yeah, so one of the first things we're going to want to do when, I guess, starting the Azure assessment and migration process is going to be getting an Azure subscription set up. So an Azure subscription basically entitles you to uh, start spinning up Azure resources and Azure infrastructure, uh, which we're going to need for our Azure Migrate tool. So uh, there's a few different ways you can go about getting an Azure subscription. Uh, first and easiest way to go about it is going to be through a CSP, a Cloud Solutions Provider, uh, which we can help you with. The advantages of going that route is really going to be uh, free support from, from Microsoft. So um, with the pay-as-you-go subscription, you, you have to pay for technical support when you're troubleshooting issues. So that's free with a CSP. Um, there's, a, there's a discount from a CSP as opposed to the Microsoft direct pricing. So, um, so that's nice. With the uh, spinning up virtual uh, machines and storage, things along those lines, you can take advantage of what's called reserved instance pricing. So if you know you're gonna have certain resources in the environment for, for an extended period of time, uh, you can take advantage of the reserved instance pricing and you know th there's a steeper discount associated with that. And as far as the other ways you could go get a subscription, you could use a, you know, an enterprise agreement. Usually this is for, for larger organizations that um, this is a direct relationship between your organization and, and Microsoft, where there's some discounts associated, but some stipulations around the agreement. So if you're not familiar with what that already is, uh, you probably don't have one. Um, and then the, the other alternative would be the pay-as-you-go subscription, which again is just a direct uh, relationship between, between your, your business and Microsoft. You just put a credit card on file and you, you get your subscription, your Azure tenant, and you can start spinning up resources that way. Um, in a pay-as-you-go subscription, you, you're just paying the Microsoft direct price. And I will say, if you decide to transfer to a CSP program, uh, once you already have a pay-as-you-go subscription, that can be uh, kind of a technical challenge uh, just because the two subscriptions are hosted on uh, different Microsoft infrastructure. So you kind of have to do a migration depending on what resources were provisioned. So it's probably best if you don't already have a subscription to go the CSP route. And then, you know, if for, if for whatever reason, if you went with the CSP subscription um, with, with us, with Managed Solution, and you decided you wanted to transfer subscriptions, um, you, you could do that very easily from transferring one CSP to another. Uh, hopefully you would never have to, but the migration process for that is a, is a lot simpler uh, with a CSP subscription. So uh, if you have any questions on how to get those set up, uh, what what option might be best just just let us know let christy know um, she'll get you squared away perfect so once once we have our subscription set up uh, we really want to hone in on what we're trying to accomplish by by migrating to azure and and what the the business initiative the business driver is um, in that in that journey so, so oftentimes we, 
we get on calls with clients and they, they want to move to Azure because it's, you know, it's, it's scalable, it's flexible, it has, um, it has these additional features that, you know, it's, it's the future. They, and they're, and oftentimes they're pretty vague about what they're trying to accomplish uh, in that move. So my question in that sense, and I, I, I don't bring up these reasons to be salesy and say, here's the, you know, the definite reasons you want to move to Azure. These are genuine questions that, that I want to try to get answered you know, as a business to see if it actually makes sense and you know, how it can benefit us. So in, in terms of the feature set, you know, are, are, is our business expanding? Are, are we trying to have a more flexible you know, remote workforce with you know, everything that's going on with COVID? Um, you know, are we trying to make our environment more resilient and you know, highly available? Uh, these would be good, you know, reasons or initiatives to try to implement in the business, um, but we but we want to pin those down because if, if if we take if we take our existing infrastructure you know, that we have on premise, we have our servers, we have storage, um, and, we, and we just take exactly that and we put it in Azure, we're not really taking advantage of of what Azure can do. So with um, you know, a, a, a good use case might be, you know, business analytics and you know, automation. If you, um, if you're in a scenario where, you know, especially everybody's working home remote, you can't just, you know, go talk to a coworker and get the information you need. Reporting has been huge. So if you're trying to combine data from maybe like a sales database and, you know, a, an accounting database and kind of make some business related decisions like that, you can, you can build that infrastructure and platform uh, inside of Azure. And that might make a lot of sense. Um, but again, if, you, if you're trying to, um, if you're just trying to move exactly what you have to Azure, you're not really taking advantage of the platform. So, so we want to, hone in on maybe one or two of those primary business movers uh, so we can build our technical solution uh, around it. Uh, as far as cost reduction, again, um, there's a common, uh, I wouldn't say misconception, but uh, a common understanding that people want to move to Azure, organizations want to move to Azure because they, they think it's going to be cheaper for their organization. They're trying to reduce IT spend. Um, and, and, and sometimes that's the case. But again, similar to the feature set, I would say if, we, if we're migrating our existing infrastructure exactly as is, and we migrate that to Azure, and we're expecting to see you know, a cost reduction uh, that's that's not necessarily going to be the case. Uh, oftentimes, just from my own you know deployment experience, if you move exactly the same infrastructure that you're running, you know, 24 by seven, and you move that to Azure, it can it can oftentimes be more expensive. So the consideration here uh, when moving would be you know, looking at our applications, uh, looking at how our infrastructure and our resources are being utilized and seeing if we can kind of uh, modernize or adapt those things to take advantage of the fact that Azure is a consumption-based platform. So if we have resources that are you know, maybe only used periodically, we can leverage some automation within Azure so those resources aren't being uh, powered up all the time, aren't available all the time, and therefore uh, incurring costs. Uh, if, if on the flip side of that, we know we have resources that are 24-7 and we, we foresee them being in the environment for an extended period of time, like I mentioned earlier, you can take advantage of you know, reserved instance pricing. You can, you can get anywhere from you know, 20 to 40% off, um, depending on you know, term length, and, and you're just getting that for, for resources that you know that are already going to be uh, in the environment and need to be used for the foreseeable future. Um, same thing applies for, for Windows licensing. Uh, you can also do reserved instance discounts, things like that. Yeah, there was a so, question about um, cost analysis um, and we can certainly help with that. And we are going to get further into this and Spencer's gonna share 
some live screenshots of what it looks like when you're looking at the cost to to migrate and what that looks like specifically for you. So um, we can certainly help out with that if uh, if you'd like, but you'll see a little bit later in the presentation what that'll look like. Yeah, absolutely. So so yeah, for we'll get into the Azure Migrate tool itself, but um, but yeah, basically running that tool will will give you the breakdown of what it would cost to run different resources that you currently have in Azure, and you can start to make you know your your technical decisions about what resources are going to move and also your business decisions about what resources can we uh, afford or you know, what feature sets can we implement. So yeah. Um, in, in terms of security, this is another um, there. This is another common conversation that comes up when talking about migrating to Azure. The there, there's some inherent benefit, right, in, in moving to Azure, the, the physical aspect of it, you're, the, the back-end network infrastructure that Microsoft has. You're, you're never going to build your own hosted infrastructure um, to, to that scale. Um, if you can, that would be very impressive. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, so, so there's some inherent security benefits uh, but we we still need to security is a very proactive thing and and ongoing. So uh, I for example, I, I got on a call with with a customer just the other day that was compromised by ransomware, uh, crypto crypto locker, I think specifically. And if you're familiar with that at all, it's it's not a good time. <laughs> they they lost access to a lot of their their data and their infrastructure and they're, they're trying to recover from it. Um, but so, so they got on a call with us and they wanted to look at migrating to Azure, migrating their, their infrastructure to Azure for basically solely security purposes. And, you know, when we kind of dove into it, um, what had happened was they had a, a terminal server that was you know, publicly available and that's that's obviously not not best practice there. Um, so the terminal server was compromised, and you know, it, everything went downhill from there. But uh, my point in bringing that up is, even though there's some inherent security benefits and there's some awesome tools in Azure for monitoring and alerting when it comes to security events, uh, we if we're not following best practices, if we're not uh, implementing you know, secure features uh, for our environment, we're, we're still going to expose ourselves to the, to the same problems. So, you know, instead of having a TS publicly available and just migrating that same infrastructure into Azure, we might look at like Windows Virtual Desktop and securing that with, with MFA. That's a much more secure solution that we can use in Azure. Um, but uh, I just want to kind of dispel the, the notion of if we move exactly what we have into Azure, it's we're secure. So, um, so it sounds like it doesn't just just moving doesn't get you secure, but it opens doors to to get you into a place where you could be more secure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, like I said, there's that inherent security benefit from the back end infrastructure that Microsoft has and the, the physical component, but. Um, but yeah, in terms of being on the platform, it puts you on the path to um, make better decisions and give you better insight into your security, uh, I guess, posture. But um, but at the end of the day, it is it's up to the, the organization to make sure that they're taking advantage of those tools. Yeah, and there's there I know there's also tools like Secure Score, and you can look at you know what's turned on in your organization versus what. Microsoft recommends as best practices. So you can kind of yep. give yourself a gauge of where you're at compared to um, where you should be at. So it's a great way to, you know, it opens doors for you, I think, right? Is that how you would say it, Spencer? Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, yeah, in terms of like with that example that I gave, like you mentioned secure score, you, if you had your you know, network open or port 3389 available to, to the public internet, that would be a, a, a red flag in that scenario. And that would be you know, Azure, Azure uh, Security Center would, uh, would pick that up real quick and, and probably throw a bunch of red flags at you. Awesome. Yeah. 
Awesome. And then uh, manageability. Uh, another common conversation that we come across is, you know, uh, with a typically it's with smaller IT teams, uh, but but even you know, larger ones as well. The the conversation comes up where we want to. The IT team wants to be focused more on developing solutions and implementing new software and applications and processes um, to help improve you know, what the business is trying to accomplish. Um, so they, they want to move to Azure so that they can kind of abstract the, the physical component of their environment. You know, uh, if, you're, if you're hosting your own infrastructure, you've got your you know, server, you got your hardware replacement cycle, um, you're managing support contracts, warranties, you're troubleshooting random issues when they pop up, you know, failed disks in your storage, things along those lines. Um, you know, so, so there's a great benefit in moving to Azure in that sense. Um, I would say moving to Azure, I, just kind of leveling expectations when, when you move, if you're used to, you know, a VMware, a Hyper-V environment, the 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 learning curve can be fairly steep. You know, it's a it's a whole new platform, a whole a whole new set of tools that um, the IT director needs to learn, that your systems administrators and and maybe even to some extent your your help desk uh, needs to get more more accustomed with. So uh, in in the short term, definitely expect when you when you're migrating that uh, there's there's going to be a, a a learning curve. And, you know, but the long term, the goal here, and I, I think it's realistic, is you migrate the entirety of your infrastructure into Azure. Uh, you end up with a, a single pane of glass, um, you know, far better reporting and analytics uh, on what your infrastructure is doing, uh, what it's costing to run specific resources. You know, uh, it, there's, the, the, the ability to fail over and manage you know, disaster recovery scenarios, the, the manageability of the platform is great. Um, I, I do just want to, again, level the expectations. The point here is to say, you know, if our primary goal is to alleviate management from our, um, from our IT staff and free them up to do other things, just, just expect that learning curve, uh, especially in the beginning. You can always get a managed service provider to help too if you need. <laughs> it's true. We we do that. <laughs> a couple of questions came in. So before we move on to the next slide, I just wanted to ask you, um, how important is this discovery phase, but like compared to running the tools? And how involved do you recommend engineers are in the business planning aspect of it? That's a really good question. Um, I I would say this is the uh, Going back to the, oh, you switch slides, I, or I switch slides, you had um, the, talking about the business driver for the move to Azure, I would say that's more important than running the tool. Now, it's definitely still very important to run, run the technical tool and get our cost analytics and data, but understanding, you know, I, look, I, I look at technology as a tool. I look at Azure as a tool or a set of tools. So, you know, it, it wouldn't make any sense for me to implement a tool that isn't solving a problem for the business. Uh, so, I, yeah, I would put a heavy emphasis on identifying what type of data we're trying to get uh, by, by moving to Azure. Are we trying to consolidate something? Are we trying to improve reporting? Are we trying to improve security? Are we trying to have a more flexible and available like remote workforce? All of, all of these are great drivers. You know, and obviously the answer can be a combination of these things, but we want to kind of prioritize as a business because you know, as you'll see, when we get into technical solutions and how that's going to impact the end user experience, you know, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to figure out what set of solutions and changes is gonna best fit the business goals. And if we have vague business goals, we're gonna end up with a vague solution and it's gonna be really hard to you know, judge and, and measure the success of the migration. Great, yeah, good answer. I think I agree with you. Um, someone was also asking, you touched on security a lot. Um, mm -hmm. What kind of security assessments we can provide 
maybe besides security center provided by Azure. Um, I know we can do, we can run network scans and secure score. Um, is there any others that I'm not thinking of or? Yeah, um, we we do have a like a security assessment uh, offering that we can do that you know independent of uh, of the Azure assessment. Uh, so it would it would really depend on what exactly you're trying to achieve. You know, is it a compliancy standard? Uh, we could we could look at that. Um, good point. If it's yeah. what's that? I said good point. Yeah, totally didn't think about the compliance side of things too. Yeah, um, so I, I wouldn't say like I'm I'm no security um, I guess focused engineer, but um, as, as an organization we can definitely help uh, you know strengthen your security posture in terms of uh, you know network security uh, best practices in terms of you know connectivity uh, accessing data and cloud kind of, security cloud yeah. you know shadow IT all that stuff so. Um, if you're interested, we can certainly follow up with you after and, and talk more about that. So, all right, let's uh, let's keep going. Top uh, top initial considerations. So now we've talked about the business drivers. What's next? Perfect. So so ideally, once we've talked about the business drivers, we have uh, one or two you know primary focuses we're trying to we're trying to achieve as a business or a problem we're trying to solve. Um, then, then we need to look at our, our current environment. Traditionally, if we're if we're hosting our, our own infrastructure, um, you know, especially before COVID, you know, we had maybe a couple hundred people working in our office, and then our server infrastructure, our network infrastructure, was largely housed in that office. So, that that works really well for kind of the traditional client server applications that many companies are still using to uh, a heavy extent. Um, and when we're when we're looking at migrating that infrastructure to Azure, we want to know how our applications and services are going to be affected by that. Because what we're doing is we're we're separating the the client from from the infrastructure that they're interacting with. And that can, can cause you know, performance issues. Um, it can, I mean, mainly performance issues uh, that, that could negatively impact the end user experience, their productivity. Um, so, so we wanna really avoid that at all costs and figure out you know, how we can overcome it. So what I would consider here um, under latency and connectivity is, you know, how how can how can our applications and services be moved to Azure and still function appropriately? Uh, in some cases, you might need to uh, migrate to a SaaS version of your application that's you know just available via via web. Um, some some applications maybe don't support that, so um, we need to look at you know connectivity. Will it function over? a site to site connection just to be a VPN. So that's over the WAN. That's that's more of a, a latency intense connection. Um, we need to consider where the the users are in relationship to the infrastructure. You know, with COVID, a lot of people are working from home. Uh, some some organizations are still have a heavy presence in an office. Um, so if for larger organizations, it might make sense to do something like express route, which is you know low latency, high throughput connectivity to your Azure environment from from your you know headquarters, let's say. Um, so we really want to figure out how our applications and services are going to be affected by that change. And then you know, kind of talking about end user experience a little bit, if, if we end up in a scenario where we need our traditional applications, um, we want to move to the, the cloud for whatever the, the business initiative might be, uh, but, but all of our users are working from home, uh, another option of connectivity might be something like a, a virtualized environment um, where we're uh, centralizing our compute and our data. So maybe something like Windows Virtual Desktop or Citrix hosted in Azure and um, then, then you kind of alleviate the the latency requirement because you're again you're centralizing your compute and your data. Um, it, in that discovery of 
it, it and I want to be clear, you're going to have multiple applications in the environment, multiple services that are being provided by different resources. So the solution might be a combination and often is a combination of a few different modes of connectivity and you know how the end user is interacting with the environment. So, so keep that in mind. It's not a one size fits all for, for every environment. It's going to be a mix. But um, what, once, once we've kind of identified our applications and, and how best to connect to them, in, we, we want to bring in our, our end user experience. This is, this is often a portion of a migration or a project that is, that is overlooked. Um, you know, we've identified our, our business driver, we've, we've overcome and you know, managed our, our technical aspect of how to uh, connect to those applications and still you know, meeting our business goals. Um, but how is that changing the end user experience? Uh, I, the ideal goal is that the end user experience gets better, uh, but oftentimes it's, it's kind of an afterthought and uh, documentation was poor, or training was poor, or communication. Um, we we want to make sure all those things are um, at the at the forefront of our decisions to make sure that you know we're not say our business goal is to reduce costs in Azure. Okay, perfect. We we have our solution developed around that. We've done our cost analytics with our tools. Users can still connect, and now we're saving money. Uh, but if at the end of the day, you know the end user is working slower or you know they they get interrupted on a regular basis or they're just not familiar with how to access something like windows virtual desktop and you know it takes them a while to get up to speed uh, but they were never really trained on it that can have a negative impact and i, I would consider that scenario you know a, a failed migration um, so we, we want to make sure that we're achieving our business goals and overcoming the technical challenges, all while making sure that the end user experience, at the very least, stays the same, if not improves. So um, I, would, I would definitely put a heavy emphasis on that. Yeah, it's and almost then, like a checklist we need to run through to make sure it checks all the boxes first. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, you'll notice like, we haven't really gotten to the technical portion of the assessment because largely this this decision and though the technical point component is is really important it what's more important like i said before is is why we're doing it and you know how it's going to impact our business because again yeah if we if we migrate to azure with a vague goal and you know we we mess up our user experience in the process there, there was no point we should have stayed we should have stayed on premise mm -hmm. um so yeah uh, definitely a checklist of sorts what once we've once we've got our you know business drivers identified latency technical components overcome and we've considered our end user experience and decided that you know, whatever change has to happen there or will happen there um, is is acceptable if not better uh, better user experience. We we want to make sure, and this is what we'll get into the the cost analytics of running the Azure Migrate tool. We're we're going to want to make sure that we can we can fit that solution in our budget and make sure that you know we we came up with this this new infrastructure. That we're going to implement in features, and this is how it's going to benefit. Uh, we want to make sure that all of our desires and, um, uh, I guess, goals in that sense fit within our budget. And then, if if we're working, if we can't fit everything in, we've at least kind of prioritized, you know, what our business goals are, prioritized our our technical solutions, and what would provide the best user experience. And then from that list of options, uh, we can see which solution will actually uh, line up in terms of costs. Perfect. So before we dive into the tool itself, um, I want to let you guys know that we are offering an Azure assessment for free with some caveats. We have to qualify and make sure um, that it aligns up, but basically Spencer's going to walk you through what this looks like 
um, in just a second, but if you want the help of an Azure expert like Spencer, we can do this with you. Um, so just keep that in mind as you're seeing what Spencer is going through. And if you want the expertise and guidance specific to your organization that Spencer is talking about here and now, we can do that. Um, so just we'll get in touch after with the recording and everything. Um, so just let us know if that's something you'd be interested in. So now we're going to actually dive into this tool and see what kind of data that it can bring to you. Perfect. Sounds good. Yeah, and just to add to the to the Azure assessment, um, yeah, not only would we just be running the tool and you know providing the reporting, um, but the helping have those business conversations. I think part of or the second part of that question you asked earlier was, you know, how involved should the engineer be in the business making decision? I, I think I might have glossed over that previously, but um, I I would say. I would say fairly heavily uh, involved in the decisions. You know, they we might not be building a budget or you know doing those types of things that maybe the CFO is handling, but um, just being intimately involved with you know, what the business is trying to achieve, and then with the technical skill set, um, thinking of solutions that best fit those goals. So anyway, running the, the Azure assessment, that would be a part of the conversations we would have. We would want to sit down with your the department heads and your, your decision makers to, to really hone in on the business goals and come up with a solution that works. And then two, as far as uh, our team running the assessment, uh, just so we're clear, it's not just me doing the, the Azure assessment and migration. Uh, we, we've got some other awesome engineers on the team that um, that will be a part of that process in discovery as well as building out the tool and reports. So, cool. So as, as far as the, the Azure Migrate tool itself, this, this, is, this is a free tool from Microsoft and in most every assessment, this is the tool we go to um, just for its simplicity, and ease of use and, and, and versatility really. Um, so this is where your subscription comes into play. You'll need that provisions uh, before you can deploy the tool. But basically, uh, once you have your tenant, you can go in there, search for Azure Migrate, and you can create a new project. Now, uh, it, it varies depending on what your environment is. If you're coming from you know, a, a VMware data center, a Hyper-V maybe, um, or you know, a combination, uh, see that and then physical workstations as well. So, or I guess servers. And it's, even it's cloud common. to cloud, right? I mean, we've done AWS to Azure, right? Yeah, so the the VMware and the Hyper-V assessment portion, you, you basically deploy a virtual appliance and that kind of scans the environment. For, for things like AWS or you know, scenarios, maybe like shared compute, if you're in a hosted, um, like private data center where you don't have access to your hypervisor, you just have access to the VMs, um, scenarios like that, or maybe like Nutanix, Hyperconverge, where you, you know, that's not a supported um, OS to run the virtual appliance on, you can always use the physical agent in any of those scenarios. So you get the, you get the same reporting and data from it. it. It's a little bit more cumbersome to deploy depending on how how many virtual machines you have or physical machines, uh, but that can be scripted or group policy or be done manually. So, and yeah, again, you get the, you get the same data, you can assess any environment and yet we've, we've done migrations from, from all of those scenarios uh, into Azure successfully. So um, it's a very versatile tool in that sense. There's, there's, I don't know that I've come across a situation where it wasn't able to be utilized. Um, so yeah, I keep that in mind. There's a few different ways it can be deployed in the, depending on your environment. So, um, but all of them are, are relatively straightforward uh, with some, some technical background. Cool. So now that we've discussed all the, the checklist, the business drivers, the technical components and all that good stuff, let's actually look at 
what you get when you go ahead and run this assessment. So I'll let Spencer talk through these to see the actual data that we're going to be collecting. Perfect. So yes, yeah, so this uh, this little screen grab here, this is this is just a high level overview of running the assessment report. So this is you know you've deployed the appliance, um, you you've let it run and kind of discover the environment, and then you can start building your reports uh, from there. So you can see that you know this this environment here was a was a VMware environment just just for context, um, and we can we can start to group machines and resources and run assessments based off of off those groups. So if we're if we're in a smaller organization, maybe 10, 20 VMs, something like that, you know, we might be assessing all of our machines at once and, and migrating them as a whole. Or if maybe even in that smaller scenario, you could group things out, or if you get into hundreds of VMs, thousands of VMs, we're, we're definitely not migrating those resources all at once. We're breaking them out into maybe departments or application sets, you know, resources associated with a specific application, and we're, we're migrating those over uh, piece by piece. So, so you can build out those groups here in the assessment. Um, you'll notice uh, on the right hand side that the confidence rating uh, that's that's associated with the duration of time that the assessment and the virtual appliance has had to run in the environment. So if you are just spinning up your your virtual appliance and doing your discovery uh, and you create an assessment right away, uh, just note that that's probably why your confidence rating is low. Um, because it just hasn't had time to analyze the consumption and the usage of the resources in the environment. And that's really what it's doing. It's, um, you, you want to make, I would say, at least let it run for a week uh, because the, the tool is looking at usage patterns. It's looking at CPU or memory spikes. It's, it's monitoring storage consumption and growth. And it's using all of those data points to to put your recommendation together in terms of sizing and pricing uh, in Azure. Yeah, and, and don't run it when a, a week that everyone's on vacation, right? Isn't that what you said yesterday? That's true. <laughs> yeah, uh, sometimes we're like, oh, you know, we're trying to knock out this IT project, you know, while everyone's on Christmas break. Well, if none of the systems are being used, your, your reporting is going to be way off. So you, you, you do want to run it um, during production hours. Like I said, at least for a week, I'd say uh, it'll. You can run longer. You can build your reports based off to a month worth of uh, uh, data points. So, uh, yeah, good point. Cool. All right. So assessment parameters. This um, this are, th these are basically all the options you can set to tweak the results that you're getting from the assessment. So first and foremost, I would say run multiple assessments. This, this whole assessment process is about gathering as much or as many different data points as possible to build the most thorough migration plan as possible. So, so don't expect, you know, if you create one group of servers, you got 10 VMs, you want to migrate those to Azure, you're going to run one assessment and with one set of parameters and that's going to be your hard and fast cost and you know everything's gonna everything's gonna match up perfectly uh, i would say that's not the the expectation and that shouldn't be the expectation so there's there's few different options here that are, are worth mentioning the i think the, the bottom one's kind of hard to see it's off the off the screen a little bit but the already have Windows Server licensing, you have the option to check that yes or no. Uh, and then as well in the top right, the reserved instances is set to three years. So that's default. And just so you guys know what that means, um, Microsoft, obviously they, they want you to move to Azure. Uh, so they're gonna show you the most cost beneficial options for, for migrating. So the reserved instances, the three year reserve, that's gonna give you the, the steepest discount on on your virtual machines and on your storage and then the the hybrid benefit being applied uh, that is basically saying that you have software assurance 
for your on-premise infrastructure, which entitles you to run those VMs in Azure. So, I mean, if you have software assurance and that's applicable to all of your VMs, that's awesome. You can save a lot of money. Um, so, so make sure that's checked, yes. But if you don't and you wanna see what it's gonna actually cost to do pay as you go in Azure, I would choose you know, no reserved in that you do not have the uh, Azure hybrid benefit. That'll show you a much more accurate uh, cost breakdown for, for the resources that are gonna be deployed. Um, in, in terms of the running multiple assessments, you'll note kind of in the middle under VM size, the, uh, the sizing mode that can be set. So you'll see it's set to performance-based. And this is what I was mentioning. This is, this is the algorithm that, that Microsoft is using that's basically saying, okay, our CPU utilization spikes at these times. You know, our average is, is this. So here's the, here's the VM SKU we're going to recommend. That's the performance-based mode of running the assessment. And you can choose your performance history there. It's set to one day. Like I said, um, I would set it to a week uh, for some more accurate information. Uh, your, your comfort factor there, again, is related to the performance-based mode of running the assessment. So if, if you want to make sure there's a bit of a buffer in terms of what the recommendation from the tool is for VM sizing or storage, uh, I would set that maybe to like 1.3 or 1.4, something along those lines, so that um, uh, so that you have some some wiggle room uh, when you when you actually do your migration. <clears throat> and then you know your your VM series there, if if again you're you're breaking things out into say applications uh, for your migration groups and you're running an assessment just for that group. Uh, you might already know that you want memory optimized machines for those um, for those resources. So you can select your VM series, you know, say the F series VMs that are going to be uh, memory or compute optimized. So um, lots of options there. And then, of course, instead of running the performance based uh, sizing mode, you can run the as is, which is going to just give you the virtual machine resources that you have on premise. It's going to correlate that to an Azure instance size, and it's going to show you that. So at the very least, I would run two assessments, one performance-based, one as is, and that will give you kind of an idea of where the tool is trying to suggest you save money in terms of performance. And then also just for budgetary purposes, see what it would cost to, to move your infrastructure the way it is, or certain resources the way they are uh, to Azure. So main takeaway from that one, run multiple assessments, get, get as many data points as possible while running the tool. Once you've set your parameters, you've run your assessment on whatever group that you've decided, uh, this is just a high level breakdown of, of the assessment itself. So you'll see, you know, storage requirements, you know, the operating system it's running. Uh, but most notably, we probably want to focus on the Azure VM size and the, uh, the Azure VM readiness. So again, the VM size is going to correlate to, if you're not familiar with the Azure platform, the VM size correlates to CPU and memory and storage. So, you know, an A series VM or a D series VM, a D2, V3 is probably going to have you know, two CPU and four gigs of RAM or eight gigs of RAM, something along those lines. So we'll want to look to see if those instances, um, we we'll want to use our better judgment or some common sense and make sure that those, those instances line up with what we're expecting to see in terms of performance. If we see something that's severely under provisioned, um, we, we want to address that. Uh, or in the same respect, if it's over provision, we think we don't need that, um, that many resources dedicated to that machine, um, we can adjust. And yeah, so once you run your report, if you find anything like that, you can go to edit properties of the assessment and kind of change some of those parameters. And then you can just recalculate uh, as opposed to recreating the whole assessment and creating a new group. 
you can recalculate and it'll it'll show you uh, the new the new numbers associated and the new uh, recommendations for the, the VM size. Once uh, once you're comfortable with that, this is just a more detailed look at the assessment and breakdown of of the resources that that were part of the group. So the applications discovered. This is uh, super useful, uh, especially for us as consultants. If if we're um, if we're running the assessment in an environment we've never been in, we want as thorough of an understanding as possible about what each server is doing. Uh, so this gives us a nice view of what applications are installed, gives us an idea of who might be accessing those applications um, in, the, in the resources that, um, that are associated with them and making sure that those map up properly with the recommendations that the, the Azure Migrate tool is, is showing us. Um, you'll, yeah, you'll note the dependency agents, uh, there was kind of a middle column there where you can add, kind of do a more in-depth analysis of those machines. So again, great for us as consultants, might also be applicable to larger environments that are kind of, you know, maybe not, have been documented super well over the years, or if there's, you know, a new uh, IT director or systems administrator, um, this, you you could run this tool to, to get a much better idea of how these servers are being utilized. So this is just a, an additional agent that's installed on these machines that kind of breaks down. You know, if you say you have like a set of application servers that you want to know how they're interacting, um, who's connecting to them, what might they be reaching out to um, you know, within the environment or even out on the internet. Um, you can get a visual breakdown of what's happening there, what ports you're connecting to, what services are in play. Um, so again, just another really good data point that we can use to, to you know, enhance our decision making. So, and then cost, cost analytics. Uh, after, Whatever everyone wants you, to know, right? How much is going to cost? This is the crux of it. Um, yeah, so we, you know, we've got all the data you know, from a technical perspective and we want to see what that's actually going to cost us. So the, this, this tool breaks it down for you. And again, we want to make sure that our sizing of the VMs, like we're, we're comfortable with that. What we would obviously do, you know, test failovers and, you know, test migrations of these machines to make sure the sizing recommendations that we've picked um, are going to function properly. Um, so again, we're running multiple assessments. So uh, once once we've really dialed that in, we can take a hard look at these costs. And these are because Azure is a consumption-based model. Um, this this is an estimate. You know, if you spin up more or less resources, or you're consuming slightly less or more storage, those the costs are going to fluctuate. But um, this gives you a really good idea for for planning and budgeting. Um, you can, this is just a high level overview of, of the initial assessment that we've been going through here. Uh, it gives you the breakdown for your compute costs and your storage costs. And then you can see, this might be more from a technical perspective, but you can see what costs are associated with what tiers of storage. So you can set those parameters in your assessment uh, when you're running it. But if you know that some applications are going to going to require premium storage, you can see the cost associated with that, and maybe even compare that to what it would cost to add, you know, uh, a flash uh, array or shelf to your on-premise environment. And you can kind of compare and contrast and see what makes sense there. Um, so yeah, uh, that's a high-level cost breakdown. Uh, when you dive into it and view the cost details of, of the assessment, you can see what costs are associated with what specific resources. And again, um, you, you can tweak these things. You can resize VMs to where you think that they would best fit. These are all just recommendations. We, we still, uh, still want to apply our, our own um, knowledge of the environment and our own testing to to firm up these recommendations or, or at least validate the recommendations if we, if we leave them the same. So again, yeah, uh, more detailed breakdown in terms of what resources cost what. Um, yeah, so with, with all of that data, I know that's a lot. Uh, we, we've 
to have the goal here would be to have identified our, our business drivers, you know, why, why we're looking to leverage this, this awesome platform. Um, what, then once we have that identified, we're, we're going over our, our technical limitations and requirements and changes that need to happen, um, how that's going to impact our end user experience. Uh, we're, we're looking at the existing environment. We're seeing if the recommendations align with you know, our performance uh, requirements. And we're, we're taking all that information. We're getting our cost data from that solution. And we're seeing if that you know, makes sense for us to do as an organization. Or are we, does that line up with our original business goal? And, and yeah, once, once we have all that information and we have a path forward, um, that, that gives us a really, really solid foundation to, to build a scope of work, to build you know, a project plan and a timeline and, and a budget for you know, whatever upcoming you know, um, timeline or um, the upcoming year. So, yeah, that's awesome. uh, kind of the Thank overview. you, Spencer. Yeah, I love that we talked, you know, both from a business and technical perspective, because those lines are becoming more blurred as time goes on and making sure that, you know, the goals align with the technology that we're using. So thank you for coming today. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. Um, I know we went a little bit over time, but I think it was really good data and information to share. Again, we can help you with this. So um, if you want to consult with us or have us, you know, perform this assessment for you to see if it's right, we'd love to chat. We will send an email with the recording and more information. Um, I didn't see any further questions come in. I think we got some good ones in the beginning. So I'm glad we got through those. Um, so thanks everyone for joining. We'll send it out and uh, have a good Wednesday. Perfect. Thanks guys. Bye guys.